Okay. Hi, everybody, and thank you for attending today's panel discussion entitled The Future of Earth and Planetary Sciences in Higher Education, a Community Conversation. My name is Dr. Kristen Drexler. I'm a full-time faculty at American Public University System in the Space Studies and Earth Sciences Department. I'll be your moderator today for this one hour session. First, we'd like to thank CISA for inviting us to speak with you all today. It's an exciting topic that we're bringing to you. Um, we're having a panel discussion or more of a roundtable discussion of faculty in the department. So um, we're going to, uh, we would love to have your participation. We're gonna open uh, the floor for questions that you can post in Q&A or in the chat, um, or you can come um, up on mic, I believe that's possible. Um, but either way, we welcome your participation. And if you have any questions after the fact, please contact your, um, your organizers for today and we'll find an expert to answer your question. Um, the topic for today, uh, we'll be sharing aspects of our exciting new graduate level concentration that's currently in development. So this is from the ground up and here's your chance to participate and get your voice heard, uh, what's important to you about earth and planetary sciences. Um, this explores the foundations of planetary geological processes, atmospheres, mapping of the moon and Mars and other planets, et cetera. There's a ton that goes into this. Um, and it's all towards preparing graduates for the future of space and planetary research and exploration. So it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be putting this together. Um, I thought it would be a good idea at this point to define what is Earth and planetary sciences. What are we even talking about to get on the same page, right? Well, it's the scientific investigation of the past, present, and future of Earth, the atmospheres and hydrosphere, as well as other planets, bodies, and the solar system. So it's no small thing. So we're, uh, we're in for a big um, challenge but we're up for it and uh, we're having a lot of fun so far. It's a dynamic and interdisciplinary field. It's a new master's level program. So we'll appeal to students uh, with backgrounds in astronomy and planetary science and space and exploration and space technologies. Uh, but it'll also appeal to those studying earth sciences and more natural sciences like geology, math, oceans and hydrology, earth and environmental sciences, biology, atmospheric sciences, paleontology, you name it. So this actually appeals to a large um, population of us in STEM. So really excited to bring this to you. Our position on this panel is that by understanding earth systems, spheres and cycles, we hope to better understand other planetary systems and vice versa. By understanding other planetary systems and space bodies, we hope to, that will inform what we understand about Earth too. So it's a collaborative thing. It's, a, um, it's exciting. So NASA's JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, defines a planetary scientist as somebody who works to improve our understanding of the planets, satellites, and smaller bodies in the solar system through studying the atmosphere surfaces and interiors of planets and understanding the origins of planets and the physical processes at work and using radar uh, and other technologies to determine physical characteristics of asteroids and other small bodies in the solar system. So with all of that, welcome. Welcome to our panel discussion and our community conversation about this exciting new uh, graduate concentration. Uh, our panelists today are representing Earth um, as well as space. So we have both space studies and earth sciences in this department. Um, we're gonna be uh, talking about both, both sides, I suppose you can say, although it's all one. Um, we'll begin with an introduction of our panelists. So thank you all so much for being here today. Um, we have both earth and space faculty here. So first the earthers, uh, I want to um, introduce, uh, he's representing Earth's atmosphere, no small thing, Dr. Lorenza Cooper. Um, Dr. Lorenza Cooper, could you say hello for a quick second? Hi, everyone. Good <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> I, I was hoping we could we could stay on him as I'm introducing. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's, if I can, if we can pin on you, Lorenza, but uh, if that's possible, Mauricio, that would be great. So Dr. Cooper is an expert in and teaches in atmospheric sciences, 
weather and climate. Dr. Cooper has a bachelor's in geography from Virginia Tech and meteorology from Florida State University. He also holds a doctorate degree in atmospheric sciences from Howard University. As both the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that's NOAA, and NASA research fellow, he participated in field campaigns studying the behavior of nocturnal mesoscale convective systems, including the particularly high impact in June 29, 2012, Derecho, that traveled over 600 miles from the Midwest through mid-Atlantic United States. He's an active member of the American Meteorological Society. And so Dr. Cooper, it's a pleasure to have you on the panel today and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right, great. And next we have Dr. Jim Myers. If we could pin Jim <laughs> on the screen too. So sorry for the- uh, <laughs> Sounds slightly painful, way. Christy. <laughs> I know, I know. Representing Earth's, um, sorry, just one second, let me close that down. Representing Earth's hydrosphere and biosphere, including Earth observation technology, satellites used for GIS and remote sensing, Dr. Jim Myers. Uh, he teaches geography, GIS, and remote sensing. He studied natural resource management and human ecology as an undergraduate. He earned a PhD in geography from Rutgers University, where he studied landscape change and how it interacts with landscape preservation efforts. His research interests include using GIS to improve conservation management efforts and to assess the environmental impacts of long-term landscape change. He's worked with conservation environmentally oriented GIS for 25 years with positions in academia, government, and with nonprofit organizations. Dr. Myers, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on our panel today, and thank you so much for being here. Great to be here, Dr. Drex. <laughs> thank you. And then I guess you can put it on me for just a quick second. I'm the, the other earther on this panel. Um, Dr. Kristen Drexler, representing Earth's geosphere and biosphere. I teach environmental science, Earth Systems History, Conservation Natural Resources, and Earth and Planetary Sustainability. My area of research is socioecological systems and human ecology. I have a master's in international affairs and natural resources management, a PhD in educational leadership with research focus on sustainable agroecology. I'm also a faculty advisor for W STEM and AWIS chapters here at APUS. And now the space studies folks on our panel. I would love to have you pin uh, Caitlin, Dr. Caitlin Milliman, if you would, please. So representing planetary bodies and the solar system. Let's see, I wanna, I wanna make sure we're pinned on Dr. Caitlin Milliman. Maybe you have to come off of mute, Dr. Caitlin. I don't Hello. know. Hello. <laughs> there you go. Hi, Dr. Caitlin Milliman. Um, you're an assistant professor of space studies and you teach undergraduate and graduate astronomy courses in the STEM school at APUS. Dr. Milliman completed degrees at the University of Florida and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her thesis research worked with, oh, you're gonna to have to explain this one. I can't wait to understand this more. But her thesis research worked with anomalous stars and open cluster environments named blue stragglers and subgiants. She traced binary properties and surface abundances to characterize these, characterize these stars and explain their origin. She is currently the faculty advisor for students for the exploration and development of space, that's SEDS, S-E-D-S, and works with NASA Radio, Radio Joe Project. So thank you so much, Dr. Milliman, for being here. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Yes, we'll have to have a, I would love to talk more about blue stragglers and sub sub giants. So they're different than sub giants and oh, astronomers sub -sub definitely need naming <laughs> lessons because <laughs> they do get confusing. It looks like a typo. Fantastic. Okay. I can't wait to learn more about this. See, we get to learn too. The earthers get to learn from space and space gets to learn from earthers. So it's a lot, it's, it's exciting. Um, Dr. Kristen Miller, if we could pin Kristen Miller, please. You may have to say something, Kristen. Hi, everyone. I'm glad <laughs> to be here. <laughs> All right. Representing also planetary bi um, bodies in the solar system, Dr. Kristen Miller is an associate professor of space studies and teaches in the astronomy concentration in the STEM school at APIS. She worked as an optical astronomer and uses APUS's Wallace E. Boston Observatory, which is called jokingly WALL-E, which I love 
to study exoplanet transits as well as supernovae events. She is also involved in a research project studying the use of alga in space exploration. Dr. Miller is the lead faculty advisor for the APUS Analog Research Group, or ARG, uh, AARG, which prepares students to serve as analog astronauts and terrestrial analogs. She is also the faculty advisor for the APUS chapter of AIAA. Her thesis work was a computational study of turbulence and magnetic plasmas surrounding young stars. So thank you, Dr. Miller. It's a pleasure to have you on the panel today. Thank you so much. All right, and finally, our, our last but not least panelist representing also planetary bodies in the solar system, Dr. Ed Albin. Dr. Ed Albin is an associate professor and the department chair for the Space Studies and Earth Sciences program. His passion is for planetary science and has been involved in space studies for more than 35 years. Dr. Ed, you may have to uh, wait or say- a, a Hi folks, <laughs> happy Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so good good to be good. here. <laughs> now, great. Now I think you're pinned, so that's great. Um, most of Dr. Albin's career was spent uh, at Fernbank Science Center in Atlanta as an instructor of space sciences. In that position, he presented planetarium programs, assisted in the direction of the facility Zeiss Planetarium and Associated Observatory's 36-inch reflecting telescope. Inspired by the Apollo moon landings in the 1960s and 70s, Dr. Albin acquired a master's degree in planetary science from Arizona State University and a PhD in planetary geology at the University of Georgia. Most of his research is centered about the study of the moon, Mars, and asteroids. He also has a lifelong love of aviation and is a certified commercial helicopter pilot. Welcome, Dr. Albin. It's a pleasure to have you here today, too. It's great, great to be here. Thank you so much. And, uh, Really uh, appreciate everybody's involvement on the panel uh, today. Thank you, us too. Okay, um, all right, Mauricio, you can unpin if you don't mind, and we will uh, we'll just kind of follow the flow of a conversation here. Um, okay, so first, I want to thank all of the panelists. It's a pleasure to welcome you all here, and thank you for participating in this discussion of our new and exciting graduate concentration in Earth and Planetary Sciences. First, Dr. Albin. I think we're still pinned on, on Dr. Albin, so we'll, we'll ask you a question. You're in the hot seat. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Shoot. <laughs> all right, great. Um, Marisi, I don't know if it's possible to unpin Dr. Albin, but if you could, that would be great. Thank you so much. <laughs> not, to, not to leave you in the spotlight for the whole hour long session, although I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. <laughs> from, from my end, I, I'm seeing you in the spotlight. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I guess. <laughs> so, so first, Dr. Albin, can you briefly describe this concentration, this new concentration that uh, we're developing and what courses it will include and also, if you could add, what inspired you to create a new grad level concentration in Earth and planetary sciences? Yeah, absolutely, Christy. This is a very exciting time period that we're in, where humanity is on the tipping point of returning to deep space. And hence, the title of our CESA conference this year is 50 Years from the Moon. And it's hard to believe um, that it was in December 1972 that the uh, last human uh, had set foot on, on the moon with Apollo 17. So it's been a long time coming. Um, I recall growing up in the 60s and 70s and being inspired by the uh, Apollo program as were many of my colleagues my age and perhaps uh, a little bit younger or maybe a little bit older. But right, right now, um, I believe this concentration in earth and planetary sciences is very important, especially with NASA's Artemis um, program with the uh, space launch system, a very big rocket that rivals the Saturn V. Uh, designed to carry astronauts uh, to the moon and beyond, as well as commercial space efforts, notably 
Elon Musk's SpaceX Starship, which is uh, currently under design and being tested in Boca Chica, Texas. And they're also building uh, a launch pad at 39A where uh, Apollo 11 and most of the other Apollo missions launched uh, to the moon. So it, it is really just uh, quite <laughs> astonishing and exciting to see the, the progress week by week. And I was down, I was down in Florida on the space co coast a couple of weeks ago for the launch of Artemis one, which uh, was mm -hmm. delayed. And, and so they're working those issues out. And I, uh, there was a period of time where uh, it was to uh, they had rescheduled the launch for uh, yesterday. So I was really hoping that we were going to have the Artemis one go up in um, uh, during the conference. But anyway, all of these things um, are coalescing to make this truly a golden age of human planetary exploration, where we're going to see boots back on the moon in um, boots on Mars, uh, astronauts studying, studying uh, these planets. So our concentration is focused um, not only on the uh, other planets of the solar system, but also the Earth. We have to keep in mind the Earth is a planet in, in order to understand, uh, especially the terrestrial worlds, uh, the moon and Mars, uh, you have to have a good understanding of the uh, geology, geography, mm -hmm. and atmosphere of, of our particular planet. So with this in mind, we have designed a graduate concentration, a curriculum that has six courses or 18 hours, which include, um, and we're going to uh, talk about these various courses uh, over over the discussion and and these and it's still as as Christy said it's it's in the works and the plan is to launch them in January of 2023. So we we are still tweaking and we're certainly looking for uh, input uh, from our guests here. Um, so those those courses include a space studies 650 foundations of earth and planetary sciences. This is one Christie is developing. And then Space Study 651, planetary Ge geologic processes. This is being built by Dr. Bader. Janet um, is, she's traveling today, so she is unable to, to be with us. Although I think she is trying to uh, listen in on her uh, cell phone. So hopefully she's uh, in the in with the uh, participants, and and so uh, the course she's working on is geologic processes, volcanism, um, or, uh, tectonism, uh, mass wasting, uh, alien processes, the wind, and so forth. Uh, Six fifty two geology of the moon and Mars is uh, well under development. Uh, by <laughs> see a big smile on. Kristen Miller's uh, face. She's working on that one. And then Caitlin Milliman is working on Space Studies 653, small bodies of the solar system, comets, asteroids, other moons around other planets. Uh, I've lost track of how many moons are, are, are in the solar system. La at last count, it was well over 80 moons in the solar system, so eight planets and and 10 times as, as many moons. Um, the next course. And uh, rings. Rings. Yes, rings and rings. I almost forgot. Beautiful image by the James Webb Space Telescope. I love it. Thank you, Caitlin. This was a brand new image that came out. And that kind of detail from a, um, a, a space born observatory is just incredible. Okay, so um, let's see, we have uh, 654 planetary mapping, which is being produced by um, Dr. James Myers, who is our resident geographer and GIS expert, and he's taking those skills off into uh, the solar system, elsewhere in the solar system. And finally, um, SPST, Space Studies 655, 
planetary atmospheres uh, with Lorenzo Cooper working on, on that course. So we have, of, of course, the gas giant planets or the very large outer or Jovian planets are primarily atmospheres, uh, really cool atmospheres, uh, but also terrestrial atmospheres such as the Earth, uh, Mars, Venus, and Saturn's moon Titan. So as we embark on the golden age of planetary exploration, we are launching this new concentration for our graduate students. And hopefully some of those students will be putting those boot prints on other worlds of our solar system. Dr. Drexler, I don't want to step on your toes here, but I do see that there's a question in the Q&A and I don't think you can see that on your phone, um, no. but it's directly related to the, the concentration and I thought we might want to address it at this point. Uh, okay. Jacob Meese asked, what would be the difference between a concentration in astronomy and one in planetary science for the master's degree program? Ooh, Ed. Yeah, I can feel that. Um, the astronomy concentration is designed um, primarily to understand objects beyond the solar system. Although we do have a course on um, lunar geology and another course on comets, asteroids, and meteorites, but it's designed to consider uh, galaxies, stars, um, uh, cosmology, and, and that sort of thing. And also there is a course, um, APUS, we do have a 24 inch plane wave CDK telescope in a, a sitting beneath a 33 foot dome in uh, Charlestown, West Virginia, fully automated, uh, can be operated online. And so we have students uh, who learn how to use uh, the telescope and collect data with that telescope. Whereas in the planetary sciences concentration, much of the data is coming from uh, probes, space probes uh, that are flying by or orbiting other, other worlds. Good question though. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Keep them coming. If you have any questions about this, we're happy to, happy to answer them for you. Okay, well, we'll go right on ahead. Actually, I had another question for Dr. Albin, but do you need a break? No, no, I think I know what that okay. question is. So that's a good segue. So we're, okay. we're good. Great. So, so I noticed something that you mentioned um, in your bio in that you have a passion for planetary science. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Um, what was something maybe that influenced you personally or professionally to be that inspired to uh, be passionate about planetary well, science? Well, really, uh, Christy, it, it was two things. Uh, I had a neighbor as, as a child who was a bit older than me, and he had a, a telescope and a, a pair of binoculars. And I, I think I was like four or five and, and recall seeing... Uh, craters on the moon, even with a pair of binoculars. I, I was astonished. And at, at that time in the mid 1960s, um, NASA was gearing up and building these big rockets, the Saturn V rocket. And it, as a kid, you know, I, I was always into big, you know, whether it was a bulldozer or giant airplanes, but a giant rocket really captivated my attention. So, you know, between um, the neighbor with a telescope and NASA doing what it was doing in the 60s, having that budget to, quote, land uh, a man on the moon before the end of the decade, that really sort of defined my childhood um, in in becoming interested in space and planetary sciences. So I, I, I always like my colleagues and folks uh, listening in today that keep in mind your, your passion for um, space, astronomy, planetary sciences uh, can be addictive. And the, the little ones around you, your students, including your students <laughs> who aren't so little, uh, can catch what what I like to call the space bug. 
So I've, I've, I've had this space bug for well over 50 years. Wonderful. Well, it's great to have you at the helm and uh, thank you so much. You're very okay. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, this next question is for uh, Dr. Myers. Do you guys mind if we just use first names? Would that be okay? That's kind of more conversational. <laughs> okay, good. Jim. Okay, yes. Jim. <laughs> these, uh, these questions are for you, but first I was wondering, you're an expert in GIS and remote sensing. Could you tell us in a nutshell, what is that? <clears throat> GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. They're uh, software packages, uh, extremely complex so software packages these days that allow us to manage, display, and analyze spatial information what's, or spatial data. What is spatial data? It's data that can be tied to a location. Traditionally, that location has been on Earth's surface, but there's no reason why it has to be. Um, and as we collect more and more data about um, all the other planetary bodies in the solar system, um, the reach has expanded, reach of GIS has expanded from the surface of the Earth to basically any body that we can uh, <clears throat> collect data on and effectively map. Um, remote sensing is just using uh, sensors, um, think cameras or similar, uh, to observe an object at a distance. Um, these can be based on drones, they can be based on satellites, on airplanes, and e even on the ground. Um, so the sensors can be anywhere. The sensors use a wide range of wavelengths. Um, they're not limited to the visible spectrum. Um, it greatly increases the kind of uh, data and the information we can pull out of that data. Um, um, and allows us to do many interesting kinds of analyses that we couldn't do if we were just limited to visible light. Um, and you can see that uh, just by that simple definition of remote sensing that all of the missions that we send to other planets where they're basically pointing cameras at them or other planetary bodies pointing cameras at them and recording images and sending it back to Earth, that's a form of remote sensing as well. Um, so again, it's just like GIS, it's not limited to Earth's surface. So cool. How did you get interested in that? Um, by dint of having an early interest in computers and then getting involved in uh, environmental science, natural resource management at a time when a lot of people didn't have that interest in computers uh, because I was willing to sit in front of a computer all day rather than go out in the field. Uh, I wound up doing GIS and remote sensing basically. Um, and this was at a time in the early mid nineties, uh, 1990s when not everyone was expected to know GIS. These days, if you get involved in natural resource management or the environmental field in general, you're pretty much expected to have some understanding of geographic information systems and probably a little bit of remote sensing as well. But back then it was uh, a bit more of a sort of cloistered uh, subset of, of people in that field um, working with those technologies. Cool. Yeah, I mean, the, I just want to pause for just a second here and explain why I'm asking these questions, these personal questions of what inspired you, what made you interested in that. And it's important, I think, uh, if for you folks in the audience, it's important to ask that question because we want to know what makes people tick, what excites them, what keeps them motivated, what inspires them, why are they studying these areas? So that's always an interesting question um, I like to ask. So thank you, Jim, for, for answering that. Um, a, a, a kind of a, a follow-up, I suppose, to this question is for you is um, how do you think space studies, the study of space influences our understanding of Earth's systems that you're used to working in? Yeah, oh, well, I think we can approach that question in, in a, a few ways. Uh, mm -hmm. One is that, you know, if we only limit our if we try to understand Earth only by looking at the Earth, it gives us a sample size of one. Um, that's not very useful, scientifically speaking. Um, but if we extend our sample size to include other planets, um, that gives us opportunities to compare and contrast, basically, uh, what we see happening on Earth versus the processes that we see happening on other planets um, and gives us more insight into all of the planetary bodies that we're looking at. Um, I could also answer this question by looking at um, how space exploration has influenced our study of Earth. Um, it, it's really hard to overestimate the importance of the Earth observing satellites that we have orbiting 
our planet right now. And those, of course, wouldn't be there if we didn't get involved in space exploration to begin with. Um, and so uh, Ed mentioned the 50th anniversary of the end of the Apollo missions. Um, there's another 50th anniversary related to space and Earth observation this year. Uh, 50 years ago, the first Landsat satellite was launched. Um, and Landsat satellites uh, have been providing 50 years of continuous Earth observation data. And I don't think it's an uh, overstatement to say that the 50 years of data that Landsat satellites have collected about Earth's surface represents the most important environmental data set that we have at our disposal for understanding our planet and environmental change. Awesome. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Jim. Okay, this next, this next question or two questions is for um, Kristen, Dr. Miller. You're an expert in astronomy. <laughs> how? So this is a personal question, going back to these personal questions. How did you become interested in astronomy? Was there a moment that you remember in your life and you said, this is what I want to do? <laughs> oh, that's such a good question. Um, so I started out my life as a physicist, right? I have studied physics um, in my undergraduate. That was my degree. Um, and towards the end of my time as an undergraduate, when I was nearing graduation and looking to move on to a doctoral degree, um, I started looking at what area of physics do I want to go into? And there are many areas in physics, right? There's nuclear physics, particle physics, fluids, all, all these different areas. And astronomy is one of them. And um, I... I had a professor I really liked at the school who had taught one of my physics classes and he was an astronomer. And he um, invited me to do some research with him uh, for my honors thesis. So I was, I was working with him on this data set and he ended up taking a group of about, I think there were three of us that he took down um, on this road trip down to Kitt Peak, actually, Arizona, Kitt Peak, Arizona, um, down in Tucson. And uh, we stayed there for about four days, and he had this stint of time on the old um, schmidt Cassegrain telescope that they have down there, which is this one of the old generation telescopes. It's been updated now, I'm sure, but back then it was, it was, you know, I mean, Nowadays, when you go to a, when you do observations at a telescope, it's, it's very remote. Even if you go to the telescope, you're in a control room and there's somebody, you know, you're feeding commands in, you don't really ever touch the telescope, but this was a very hands-on experience at Kett Peak with this particular telescope. And we, there was a little room for astronomers. So we slept a little suite with, with rooms and we slept right next to the telescope basically. And we would walk in and, um, and it's right there in front of us as we're operating all of the controls and opening the dome and everything. Um, and just, you know, standing out on the mountain in, in Tucson in the dead of night with, with the beauty of the sky above you and getting these amazing images, watching them come in off of this telescope. I was hooked. I was just absolutely hooked. So I came home from that and, um, looked exclusively at astronomy schools for my doctoral degree. So that's kind of what funneled me into this path, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I can thank you for telling us that story. I was transported. I was there with you at Kitt Peak. That's so cool. Okay, well, Dr. Miller, Kristen, sorry. Um, I'm going to reverse the question to you. So as, a, as a, an astronomer, a space um, expert, um, reverse the question that I asked Jim. How do Earth studies influence our understanding of space and space studies? Um, and by, you, can, you can answer it vice versa as well, but I'm curious from your perspective, from your vantage, how do you see that studies here on Earth impact our understanding of space? Hey, um... Yeah, absolutely. I can take a stab at that. And I have to say, I, I really love Jim's answer and especially the, the reference to Landsat and the sensing and you know, the view that was so well said. But I think um, what I would say about the opposite view is that um, especially for solar system studies and uh, moving now outward into other solar systems that we're discovering when we're talking planets, um, comparative planetology is a an incredibly useful tool. And what that means is um, we take what we know about the earth and we use that to help us understand 
what we're seeing elsewhere in the solar system or on other planets, um, because we have the best data on Earth, right? Um, <clears throat> no matter how many rovers we send places or orbiters, we have the most data on Earth. And so we, we look at what do we know about, you know, the interior of the Earth. And then we look at the same processes that we see on, you know, Mars or, or the moon or, you um, you know, the same kind of structures on Mercury or something, and we look at, okay, what's the same and what's different? And that helps us to better understand what's going on in the in the interiors of those planets and what happened in the past on those planets. And we can look at, you know, the atmosphere. Um, Mars and Venus and Earth are all, we're, we're really, you know, not that different in our distances from the sun where, you know, Mars is obviously the farthest, Venus the closest, but there's there's not that much difference between them compared to, for example, you know, um, Neptune and, and the Earth or something that's much, much farther, right? So we're all kind of here together. And yet the Earth has evolved to have this breathable atmosphere with temperatures that support water and liquid water on our surface. And, you know, Venus certainly has not, and Mars has not, and Venus went one way and Mars kind of went the other way. And why did that happen? Because there's three fairly similar sized objects in the same. So as we compare, as we learn more about what made that happen on Earth, we can then look at Mars and say, okay, so what didn't happen on Mars or what happened differently on Mars? to lead us to this point and what happened differently on Venus to lead us to that point. And it's, it's really valuable. Um, it's a really good way of, you know, understanding those processes. And I think it'll become even more important um, as we discover these new and interesting exoplanets that are challenging our understanding of what a planet is and how a planet forms and what kinds of planets there are, um, you know, that, that we take now we're going to be taking not just what we know about the Earth, but what we understand about the Earth and Mars and Venus and Jupiter and Saturn. And now we're using that and we're trying to understand these other planetary systems, these exoplanetary systems, as we call them. And, you know, and so I, I think it's I think it's the way science is done. I think it's how we do things in science. It's um, it, it helps us to to better understand things. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> totally, totally. I love the way you answered that. I also want to give a plug here to your uh, to something that you supervise, um, the AARG uh, missions. So maybe you can say a few words about that. But one thing that I was reading the other day about AARG, and it might help uh, bolster your answer to this question too, is that one of the most popular um, programs in AARG is plant biology. People, well, maybe you can explain a little bit what is uh, what is AARG and what what do you do? Take transport us there to a mission. Absolutely. Um, so, so AARG stands for the APUS Analog Research Group, or ARG, as we call ourselves, and we are a group, uh, a student-led, faculty-supported group that uh, trains and prepares students to participate in analog missions. So, a terrestrial analog is a habitat. Um, a living area on Earth that mimics as best it can the um, living environment in space, right? So there's some things we can't really mimic very well, like microgravity, right? And we we don't mimic um, radiation exposure, but there are other things that we can mimic very well. And some of those are um, the fact that uh, astronauts are very isolated, um, that they are confined to a small space, that they're in an extreme environment, which means that, um, you know, they're they're surrounded by, you know, sort of a harsh, dangerous environment. Um, oh, thank you, Caitlin, put our website in the in the chat. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, and so, so basically, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the in the analog panel that we had. But basically, um, the reason that analogs are useful, and there are analogs all over the world and all over the United States, but um, the reason they're useful is that we can send teams of people, in our case, students um, and some faculty members, to go and live in these environments for a period of time, and they live and they work on astronaut schedules, and they um, can test procedures, they can test. Um, human factors, we can do uh, plant research very easily there, we can do um, EVA type research um, using um, EVA suits, we can test out how they work so that then when we send all of those to space, um, you know, we, we are 
we have the procedures down pat and we have the materials mm -hmm. down pat and it's very expensive to send someone to space, but it costs very little to send some comparatively to send someone on an analog, right? And and on so on an analog, we can get numbers, right? We can get the statistical sampling to um, really say something about astronaut life. And and I think it it sort of here's my tie into comparative planetology. It's it's the same sort of thing, right? We take what we learn on Earth and then we're going to apply that into space. Um, and the reason that we do so many um, biology experiments is one for our group anyway. The two habitats we that we well the one we go to the most and then the one we're going to next both have a well established greenhouse. Um, biology is important to NASA uh, both in terms of crew morale um, people. <laughs> just like gravitate towards the plants and feel a little bit better in space, you know, um, and also for nutrition, um, fresh source of fresh food, as well as future sustainability in any kind of long-term space exploration or settlement where um, you wouldn't be able to rely on earth resources, right? So we do a lot of those in analogs. Um, we do a, a lot of human factors research in analogs and, and um, you know, what does the effect of living in this environment have on, on the group dynamic, on individuals as well as the group dynamic and how can we improve that experience? So thanks for letting me plug that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really, I think it's fascinating. I mean, another uh, benefit of plants, of course, is uh, uh, the carbon exchange. Speaking of which, mm -hmm. let's move on to atmospheres. And uh, Dr. Cooper, Lorenza, um, you're an atmospheric science scientist. Uh, you're an expert in climate change. Um, and all things atmospheres of Earth. Um, so before APUS, you were a fellow at NASA. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and your background? Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. What inspired you to, to study atmospheric science? Okay, great, great. I'll start with your last question first. So um, what inspired me? A very simple story. When I was really young, I remember asking my father, what makes the trees blow, right? You know, they would just move and, you know, to a three, four-year-old, you're just like, they're magically moving, what's happening? And he came up with a nonsensical answer that, well, one tree moves and it touches the other one and that causes that one to move. And, you know, I ran with it for a little bit, few months. And so I was like, well, this tree is standing by itself. There's, there's nothing to touch it. So what, <laughs> you know, what's causing that to move? And from there, um, it just transitioned to a love of storms. One of my earliest memories was actually Hurricane Hugo, which was 33 years and one day ago. Um, and we were the model citizen of things not to do for an approaching hurricane. And we decided to evacuate in the middle of the hurricane. But as a result, I have, you know, these vivid memories of um, just our interactions with weather. And from there, it grew into a hobby. Um, and for the longest time, I had no understanding that that hobby could actually be a science or something that you would actually study in school. Um, I actually started off school in geography because I thought that was the closest I could get to meteorology. And it wasn't until I was able to go storm facing um, while at Virginia Tech. Oh, I was like, oh, wow, this is actually something that you can see. So uh, that transitioned, um, I had the opportunity to attend Howard where I became a NASA fellow. Um, at Howard University, they have a, a separate Northern campus in Beltsville, Maryland, just about three miles away from the Goddard Space Flight Center. And so at this particular campus, we have just a suite of um, climate observant instruments. Uh, we have remote sensing instruments that are pointing up, upwards. We also had the opportunity to um, use radar, launch weather balloons, and also work in partnership with them as um, they try to validate satellite observations. Uh, there's been lots of discussion today already about, you know, the, just the importance and how important uh, satellites have been, remote sensing have been just in advancing all of our sciences, right? It's our biggest data source. Um, satellites tend to be most accurate when, they observe, when they're observing things uh, closest to it. Um, for Earth and its atmosphere and the weather that we interact, where it just so happened to be the farthest distance from the satellite. So it's kind of struggles a little bit. So being able to validate that was one of our primary missions. And so what we would do is we would launch weather balloons um, in sequence with uh, satellite overpasses. And so here in the uh, Northern Virginia, Washington DC area, 
just so happened, satellites tend to pass about 2 p.m. and 2 a.m. So we had fun getting up to launch at 2 a.m. many nights. <laughs> um, yep. But yeah, so it was, uh, you know, I, I, I really enjoy it and I am thankful and happy to be able to share once again with my passion and the area of study that I'm just an expert in. That, that is awesome. How do you think what you know of atmospheric science here on this planet, how will that transfer? Or I guess, what are you excited to learn about other planet atmospheres? How does that inform, you know, what you understand here, how does that inform what you think you'll, you'll, you'll know or you'll find out about other planet atmospheres? Yeah, so, you know, that, that is a very good and tough question because for one, we don't have much interaction with the other planets' atmospheres, right? Mars, we, we have, um, have some interaction as far as the different rovers and things that have landed. Um, but ultimately, we're trying to understand, and as I believe uh, Kristen mentioned before, I really like how she wrote it in that, you know, our neighboring planets were also similar. One planet went one way, one planet went the other. I don't know why I never thought about it in those terms, but you're exactly right. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, you know, just on Earth, we just happen to be in this perfect balance. So trying to understand, um, you know, as she mentioned, why those planets trended the way they did, but also understanding that, um, you know, there's an evolution involved with all of these planets and everyone's atmosphere has been evolving and changing, just like, I, right? We're in, a, we're in a time period now in which we believe our climate and atmosphere is changing quite rapidly, relatively mm -hmm. speaking. Um, so understanding what's happening on those planets could offer some insight to us, but obviously most of our data is taken here. So that could be important for understanding what's happening there, especially as we try to prepare for, you know, human missions to Mars, what would, mm -hmm. what would they encounter? Um, you know, Mars have prolific, well, they can have prolific dust storms. Sometimes that's tied to its, um, it's revolution around the sun and its proximity to the sun. So how do we, you know, how do we mitigate or manage all of these things? It's just, it's also exciting. And new areas to explore. So I look forward to working with students. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I saw something come through on the chat. Can anybody read uh, what that, what that is? It's a question. I can't read it, but I saw it like a a little snippet of it. Um, yeah, Christy, there's a there's a question for Lorenza um, from Michael Wallace. He says, Dr. Cooper, I have been enthralled by the cause and effect of the atmosphere on the planetary surface, more so as these hurricanes start up again. Oh, <laughs> right. So, I mean, largely for the hurricane lovers, it's been a horrible season up until the last couple of weeks, right? And so now we're at the precipice of we have what Fiona making its way rapidly toward Canada which will likely be the strongest storm to ever hit Canada's, uh, well, at least in recorded history. Um, and then potentially next week, we could have a new storm, potentially, um, I think Hermione is the next name, or it could be whatever the eye storm. Um, it just depends. There's something off of the coast of Africa that is also begging for attention at this point. But we will see because eye storms are notable for being horrible storms. So everyone's drawing their attention to the Caribbean to see if this is going to be our ice storm of the year or not, as it makes its way, looks like, towards Florida this afternoon. So we shall see. Okay, and and understanding, Lorenza, understanding how at atmosphere and oceans and how all of those things connect. Um, when we study on Earth and we study the spheres, the hydrosphere, the geosphere, the biosphere, the atmosphere, and also the cryosphere, um, and how those things are interacting that also, like, like for example, hurricanes, ocean temperatures rise, um, hotter air temperatures, uh, creating uh, all sorts of madness in the form of storms on this planet. It'd be really interesting to apply what we know about that and the interaction of Earth's spheres to other planets as well. So that's an exciting, also an exciting um, area of study as well. So thank you, Lorenza. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this next question is for Dr. Millen. Caitlin. Caitlin, this question is for you. You're an expert in astronomy as well, and we'll be building a class called Small Bodies of the Solar System. What is that? Can you tell us a little bit about what that what does that mean? It's basically a class for the leftovers. Um <laughs> <laughs> And so partly it's um, topics that aren't covered in a lot of detail in the other courses. You know, the other courses are hitting some of the bigger stuff 
in in the solar system and it's also just a class about the leftovers from the formation of our solar system so things like the asteroids that didn't make it into planets and the dwarf planets that didn't make it into planets and the moons that have been disintegrated into rings and so <clears throat> it's a lot of kind of stuff that's the in between and um overlooked a little bit but uh maybe i think that would have an asterisk by it that it's overlooked historically because a lot of things like like this picture of Neptune and the clarity with which we can get the rings and the moons of the Neptune system. And I mean, that just, you wake up and you see the spectacular image that was gotten in such a, like a blink of an eye with JWST. Whereas before instruments like Hubble would be much more difficult to get this kind of level of detail for these small systems in the far reaches of our solar system. And comparatively like we haven't had a mission to Uranus and Neptune since Voyager. So these planets have only been visited once up close. So to be able to get this level of detail on the minuscule sizes of these, you know, dust grains and ice particles that are orbiting around Neptune, it's just incredible. So I think that there's a lot of attention that's going to be going to these leftover objects in the solar system. And it's really exciting to kind of explore a lot of the advances that are coming on these systems. And then um, also to think about the robotic missions that they want to send to Titan and Cassini's view of Saturn's moons. I mean, this is such a huge growth in these um, small bodies that kind of aren't really well placed in some of these other courses. It's so incredible. It's also really incredible to see your passion for these topics. So how, how would you say you were inspired or influenced when you were younger to study this, to study astronomy, small bodies? Um, and how were you, how are you inspired? How did you come to study this? Oh gosh, um, Kristen and Lorenza's stories. I, I was like, oh yes, yes. <laughs> um, cause I, growing up, I really love math. I really love patterns. I love learning calculus, like through high school. And, um, I just thought that that was engineering. I was going to be an engineer and that was the step forward. And so enrolling in college and I just took astronomy courses because I was interested in it. You know, I, I loved the images that we would see and I would beg my parents to like get the magazine so I could flip through and see all those wonderful nebula and planets and stars and globular cluster images and those kind of things. But I never really thought it was a career path. I always thought it was just something that I enjoyed learning about. And then going into college and enrolling in an introduction to astronomy course. And as Ed mentioned, you know, I caught the space bug and it was really like, how far can I take this? Because I wasn't interested in statics. I wasn't too interested in, um, you know, circuits. I really wanted to do astronomy and that's where I could sit and actually do the homework and <laughs> really get engaged with the lectures. And so that just really drove me to see how far I could take it. And one of the other things was the community going into those astronomy classes and those homework help groups and the people in those courses were so welcoming and so nice and you know i mean we're college students where you know they we weren't always the best people but it was just that sense of community and that sense of belonging yeah. i found that in astronomy and that wasn't in engineering as much. And I didn't feel that in physics as much. And so I really think that is a special field. Um, and I think the national statistics really bear that out, that the astronomy field is m much more welcoming. And that was definitely my experience. And I think my longevity in the field is because of the community that is fostered in this area. That's so great. I love that. Speaking of sense of community, I love how you characterize the sense of community, sense of belonging. And that's sort of what this whole conference is about to me, is about um, people in this community uh, being able to share what they know, um, network, dialogue a bit. And so I kind of wondered for you and for Kristen and for Ed, I've seen you all present uh, yesterday and today uh, at this conference. 
What has been the most interesting thing about this conference so far to you? Are you learning anything new at this? Or are you excited about some new endeavor? Well, yes. Yeah, I think I mean, this has been a fantastic conference. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. did you want to go, Caitlin? <laughs> no, go, go, go. Oh, um, I would say, okay, so my, I was thinking about this this morning, actually, my big takeaway from this conference, um, just from the different sessions I've attended and the speakers I've heard, and there's been so many good ones, I, you know, you can't go to all of them, but the ones I've heard have really focused on um, sustainability and the need for international cooperation in space. And so those are going to be my two takeaways from this. Um, I've heard some really um, fabulous talks that have really um, highlighted those areas. Um, Good. Yeah, great. Um, I was just listening to uh, to the keynotes, Dr. Freeland, how he was saying um, this, his session was about regulation of space and um, the apex issue for him really, uh, he articulated uh, that there's no conflict, that when the exploration of space, there's no conflict. There's just, just a spirit of cooperation, collaboration and exploration or international cooperation as, as you stated. And he did mention some sustainability issues too with space debris and things of that sort. Um, and I, I wondered what you thought about that. We could ask Ed or Caitlin, what, did you, what do you think about what, um, what Dr. Freeland was, was saying? <laughs> yeah, I I think it's uh, fascinating, and um, I, I totally agree. And what, what, one of the what are the most interesting things um, uh, on on a side about this conference is the uh, multidisciplinary yeah. aspect of of the conference. Uh, the fact that we have scientists, we have engineers, we have space entrepreneurs. Um, we have students. And so it it really has, you know, going back to your original question, that that has has always impressed me about the uh, CISA conference yeah. is, is the wide variety of of uh, folks uh, who participate as as a planetary geologist and planetary scientist. Um, many of the conferences that I go to are very, very narrowly focused on on a particular uh, topic. And so um, it, 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 this is pretty cool. It, it's almost because there are so many multiple sessions going on at the same time. It sort of reminds me of uh, a three ring circus. I mean, you're you're like a kid trying to decide which which one do mm -hmm. I want to go to, uh, which exactly. one is going to be the most interesting and entertaining. <laughs> But yeah. um, go, go ahead, Caitlin, I, I may have cut you off there. No, I want to say that I can completely agree and kind of going in selfishly, I, I have a very strongly biased background in astronomy. And so being able to attend CESA for multiple years and it's kind of like, oh, that's a new topic I've never really considered. Oh, that's a new topic I've never experienced. And it's the, the international aspect of it, the policy aspects of it, the student interest in it. I mean, I can blanking on all of the different topics, um, but it really is so broad and yeah. selfishly for me, it's so exciting to see all the different avenues that you can take space and space yeah. education. Um, that I had never really encountered before. Um, so that's, and every year it's something new. So that's really exciting to constantly be growing in that sense. Um, in relation to conflict, I, I hope that things are there. I definitely see a lot of, from my very limited expertise in this subject, I'm not a space policy or politics kind of person, but I see a lot of competing interests mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily, see a lot of people getting ahead of those because it is such a new territory. And so a specific example I'm thinking of is the mega constellations mm -hmm. that are going up. And especially in the astronomy community, the reaction to that and the anticipation of that, and then there being decades and decades long surveys that have been in the works for an extensive period of time that they're having to rewrite 
to kind of meet these new challenges and and deal with this new environment. And I hope that that can be kind of smoothly done um, in this specific specific example and then more broadly. But I also hope that there's a little bit more foresight and people getting ahead of it because these things are in the works for decades and decades. And those all a lot of those projects are kind of coming to a head is my sense. Yeah. yeah. I, I totally hear you. I totally agree with, with everything you all have just said, Ed, Kristen, and Caitlin, um, in the past few minutes. Um, I want to, to reiterate our position on this panel is that um, what we understand about Earth's systems, uh, it can influence and inform what we know about space systems and, and vice versa, what we know about space, planets, small bodies we can begin to understand other things that are happening on earth that we don't understand. So it, it works, it's collaborative. And I think that's what's beautiful about this department is that it's collaborative, it's space studies and earth sciences. So um, thank you all for your participation in, in, this, um, in this panel. I have one final question for everybody. And I'd like you to take about, no pressure, about 60 seconds to answer this question each, because we have about, nine minutes left on this panel. But I wanna give you an opportunity to talk about your courses in this new concentration, the graduate concentration that we're currently building, Earth and Planetary Sciences. Um, so why don't we start with Lorenza, not to put you on the spot, but you are teaching or you're building uh, an atmospheres course, planetary atmospheres. Could you tell us a little bit about what that will be about? Yeah, sure. Um, so with this course, um, like much of we will, we'll, oh, excuse me, like much of what we've talked about today, um, I envision that we start off focusing more so on uh, Earth uh, and just getting a, a, a better understanding of Earth's atmospheric. So like the different spheres, um, atmospheric composition, uh, Earth's gravitational acceleration, um, those type of things, and then and then incorporate that into other other planets, and and understanding how, well, understanding those differences and similarities. Um, much of the focus will be on the terrestrial planets, uh, so Venus and Mars. Um, however, I do have interest in other planets as well, and in, in terms of the atmosphere and storms. So most notably, like Jupiter, the Great Red Spot. spot. What's going on with that? That's been of such. Um, that's been of such focus over the last few decades in that, you know, well, is it is it shrinking? Is it breaking apart? What's happening with that as it interacts with um, different cyclones or anti-cyclones? Um, I think I mentioned earlier about Mars and their dust storms, things of that nature. Venus is greenhouse gases um, and how that's affecting this climate there. Um, so all, all these different things. I know that Ed is also interested in Titan. So that's one area that I'm really looking forward to exploring more. Um, as for right now, I actually don't have too much understanding in, in that. So that is one area in which I am really, really studying. And I think overall, I'm going to say it really, really quickly. Overall, what I'm really excited about is this very interdisciplinary relationship. And working with students, especially at this level, um, will have this deep passion for the subject matter. And so I really... Uh, plan well. I plan to have the course ready and up going at the beginning of January, but I look forward to it growing and evolving and getting feedback from the other students as well and incorporating that into the classes. Hopefully, that was sixty seconds. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, it was right on sixty seconds. And <laughs> and uh, my yeah, I have a follow up and I want to take your class. I hope that's okay. I'll, I'll uh... <laughs> oh no, the more the merrier. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, next we'll talk to Jim. Jim, tell us about your class is going to be on planetary mapping. Can you tell yes, us what indeed. that class is going to be about? Yeah. Yeah. And I can be short and sweet. Um, it's basically an introduction to GIS and remote sensing with a focus on how they can be used to observe and map Earth and other planetary bodies. Um, it includes both theory and some hands-on practice uh, using the technology uh, for mapping features on Earth and beyond. Um, planetary mapping is sometimes used in a relatively specific manner to mean planetary geological mapping, um, but I'm using it in a much more expansive sense. Um, I certainly will look at planetary geological maps, but we'll look at ways to map other things as well. Very cool. There was a somebody asked a question in the chat. Sorry, I'm, uh, I just saw that pop up for the 
Can, can you read that? Yeah, that's a comment by Michael Wales. Um, this is that the new concentration sounds interesting and he wants to look into it more. And he thanks us <clears throat> for the walkthrough. <laughs> Thanks. See you in class. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, all right. So uh, let's see who's next. Kristen, could you tell us a little bit about your co uh, course on geology of the moon and Mars, please? Sure. Um, so basically what um, this course will do is uh, pull from what we've learned from the rovers, um, human exploration on, you know, the Apollo missions on the moon, as well as uh, the orbiters on the Earth and Mars. And we're just going to take a deep dive into everything that we know about the geology um, of, of those of those objects. Um, and I'm, I think it'll be a fun class. I've got some labs in there that are based on uh, online data sets and some simulations I found that are pretty cool. Um, so I, I think it'll be really interesting. And these, you know, I feel like those topics in this class are so relevant because um, the, it's NASA's current goals, right? We're, we're heading back to the moon currently in that process. And then the next step is Mars. So I think it's a, a great time to really delve deep into what we know about these two objects. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And Caitlin, what about your class, Small Bodies of the Solar System? What will that class be about? So we are going to be running through meteorites, asteroids, comets, rings, um, Jovian moons, trans-Neptunian objects, uh, near-Earth objects, and some of the deterrent um, and survey deterrent maneuvers and surveys that are going on for there. So we're kind of going to be doing a real rush through the small stuff of the solar system and hopefully from learning and investigating those small scale objects, learn more about the history and the large scale um, evolution of our solar system. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, Ed, it looks like you have such a great team here. Um, I wanted to get the final word for you. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We have a, a wonderful team. And uh, I, I did want to uh, put a plug in for our uh, planetary geologic processes course yeah. that yes. Janet, Janet is working on. And this course will take a look at volcanism, tectonism, aeolian or wind processes, fluvial processes, water um on the earth students will learn uh about these process here uh these processes here on planet earth as an analog to similar processes or this very same processes that are for example happening on mars or perhaps venus uh which which is a very dry planet but it does have wind and volcanism and tectonics um, and even moons. Uh, there's a moon around Jupiter called Io, which is the most volcanically active world in the entire solar system. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really ex excited about that course, but uh, certainly all of all of these courses and launching our, our concentration uh, will go into the January 2023 catalog. Okay, thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for joining our panel discussion today. Sign up for the concentration, the graduate school concentration in uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences, and we will see you in class. Thank you, everybody. Take care.